This is an interactive map created by the University of Edinburgh, which shows the location of witches and witch trials from the mid-16th century until the early 18th century. It makes for some fascinating reading, and if it's something that interests you, then you should definitely check it out. We will put a link in the description to the map. As you can see, the Highlands had its fair share of witches. Between 1661 and 1662, witches up and down the country were being exposed and dealt with by the establishment. Prickers were men that were employed to identify witches. We take a journey with one of those prickers, as he made his way through the Highlands calling out witches as far north as Tain. Let's walk in the shoes of John Dixon. The year is 1661, and Scotland is in the grips of a large-scale witch hunt. Up and down the country, women and men are being identified, tried and executed as evil servants of Satan himself. The good, honest and God-fearing people of the country live in terror of these devil worshippers. Even worse than that, neighbours, mothers, wives, sisters, brothers, husbands and even respectable members of the nobility were being exposed as witches. This created an air of panic, fear and mistrust of even those closest to you. It also presented an opportunity for anyone to exact revenge upon their enemies without direct physical or legal action themselves. If you don't like your mother-in-law, have a noisy and annoying neighbour. Maybe you just fancy getting rid of the wife without the cost and shame of a divorce. Accuse them of being a witch and let the authorities take care of the problem for you. It's in the midst of this chaos that we find ourselves joining in a witch trial on Newbur Fife, a well-known notorious witch pricker by the name of John Kincaid, plying his trade in front of a public crowd. Witch prickers were men that were paid to identify witches, and they were paid very well indeed. It averaged six shillings per day for maintenance and six pounds per witch identified. In stark contrast, the average man at that time would receive a wage of one shilling per day. A pricker's method of identifying a witch involved the pricker stripping the accused naked, shaving all hair from their body before inserting a large needle into moles and spots in the body. Not just your average sewing needle either. These were handmade pins several inches in length, such as this pricker's pin used at the time. The belief was that when the devil made a pact with you, he would leave a mark on your body. When pierced, this mark would not bleed and or cause pain. These marks were believed to be in the armpit, under the eyelids, or in the private area of the accused. And it was in these areas pricking would commence, by inserting the needle in as far as it could go before withdrawal and inspection for blood or a painful reaction. This was done many times until the desired effect was achieved. Often, the accused would simply pass out and unable to express pain, so the pricker would declare they were indeed a witch as suspected. So this was a show that pricker John Kincaid was putting on in Newbar Fife for the crowd of onlookers, including one individual that was so inspired by this show, a spark of inspiration was ignited, and their journey on the road to becoming one of the Scottish Highlands' most notorious prickers began. This story has more twists and turns than your average Grand Prix circuit. So buckle up and enjoy the ride as we walk with witch pricker John Dixon as he left his hometown of Forfort and Fife to travel to the Scottish Highlands and undertake a new career as a witch pricker. If you enjoy true stories from the past and have a love for the beautiful Scottish Highlands, consider subscribing and following to join us in uncovering the Highlands and its fascinating history. In March 1662, John Dixon turned up in Elgin at Spiney Palace, an impressive palace that was the seat for the bishops of Murray. Here Dixon presented himself to the bailey of Spiney, declaring himself an accomplished witch pricker. The bailey must have been impressed, as without question, he employed Dixon on the spot. Dixon's first case was more than likely a well-known local witch trial. The trial of Isabel Gowdy is Scotland's most famous witch case, and is where the idea of witches being in covens came from, along with flying on brooms and shape changing usually into cats. Isabel Gowdy lived in the area of Loch Loy and was tried in Aldern. The pricker that examined Isabel and identified her as a witch is not named in documents, but is highly likely it was our John Dixon. He was very successful since he managed to get Isabel to confess to a long list of horrendous devil worshipping crimes, very likely through the use of torture. Dixon had Isabel singing like a canary at her trial. 
She declared she met with the devil in the kirkyard of Aldern Church and gave her very soul to Satan alongside another witch. Apparently the devil marked her shoulder, probably the point identified by John Dixon, sucked out her blood before sprinkling it all over her head and renaming her Janet. She freely de declared how she met with other witches in her coven in the kirkyard of Nairn, where they raised an unchristened child from a grave before hacking it to pieces with their fingernails and toenails. She gave up the names of all the witches in her coven and described how they would shapeshift at night into jackdaws, cats and hares. She spoke of how her and the other witches in the coven would often have sex with the devil in the kirkyards. While Isabel and her coven's fate is not recorded, it is highly likely they were all executed by the local authorities. The usual method of execution being tied to a stake, strangled to death before their body was burned at a stake. John Dixon now had experience under his belt and continued to ply his new trade as he made his way throughout the Highlands, being responsible for the identification and execution of at least a further six witches. In Tain, a man by the name of John Hay had fallen foul of a court worker. That court worker employed Dixon as a pricker to identify Hay as a witch. I'm sure in hindsight Dixon wished he had not taken this particular case, as Hay was a court messenger, a job that bore the royal coat of arms, and Hay had high connections. He petitioned the government for Dixon's arrest and his pleas were answered, with a warrant being issued for the arrest of John Dixon with immediate effect. Dixon slipped out of sight as quick as he could, seemingly to have disappeared off the face of the earth. We next find ourselves in the Glen of Strathglass, where trouble had been brewing for some time between the landowner and his tenants. Alexander Chisholm was the chief of Clan Chisholm and owned the lands of Strathglass. A majority of his tenants belonged to the Maclean clan and had resided in Strathglass lands for over 200 years. As tenants, they were God-fearing, hard-working people who had always paid their dues. However, Chisholm had other ideas for the land and needed them gone. Legal means was not an option, as while it was very costly and lengthy, he also had no grounds in which to evict these good tenants. It looked like Chisholm was stumped, stuck with tenants he didn't want. It's a shame they're not witches, commented a family friend over drinks one evening. Then you could let the authorities get rid of them for you, he laughed. Made in jest to try and ease a stressful conundrum for Chisholm, the man was not to know that a seed had been planted in Chisholm's mind. Witches indeed, replied Chief Alexander, who were probably stroking his beard and staring into the distance. He may have let out a small cackle of his own, who knows? What we do know is that Alexander Chisholm announced 15 of his tenants were actual witches and demanded they be detained and questioned. The 14 women and one man were indeed arrested and taken to Fraser Church in Wardlaw to be interrogated. When dealing with witches, what the elders of the church need was a pricker. From nowhere, a man appears declaring himself to be an accomplished pricker, an expert at identifying witches and obtaining confessions. Without question, Chisholm and the elders declared Mr James Patterson hired for the job of pricker in the Strathglass case. James Patterson had an uncanny resemblance to another notorious pricker, a pricker that had escaped arrest by the authorities in Tain. Patterson was indeed the same person as pricker John Dixon, who was on the run. After leaving Tain in haste, he had changed his name and presented himself to Chisholm as soon as he heard about the ongoing Strathglass situation. Immediately he went to work, lining all 15 of the accused up in the churchyard at Wardlow, stripping them naked in front of Chisholm and spectators before shaving them completely. He then went from one to the next with his pricker's pin jabbing their bodies continuously until he found the devil's mark upon them. He then, one by one, subjected them to torture in order to obtain confessions. His methods of torture included sleep deprivation, burning of the feet upon an open fire, hanging by the thumbs, bound by ropes and dragged behind a horse, and whipped. During these tortures, one of the women died from her injuries, and another lost her mind completely, but not surprisingly, all confessed. Thanks to Patterson, aka Dixon's work, Chisholm and his commission submitted the case to the Privy Council in Edinburgh, who accepted the case and instructed Chisholm to deliver the prisoners to Edinburgh for trial. The cost of transporting these prisoners would have fallen upon Chisholm, which he was not prepared to pay, so he requested that him and his commission hold the trial locally. Again, the Privy Council accepted and forwarded instructions on how to hold a witch trial. At this point, 
One of the prisoner's distraught husbands contacted the McLean chief, Sir Rory McLean of Duart on the Isle of Mull, begging for his urgent assistance in the matter. Rory immediately petitioned the Privy Council, informing them of the hidden agenda Chisholm had in this case, that he was using witchcraft hysteria as means of forcing the tenants from his lands, and the accused were not actual witches. The petition worked, and in October 1662, the Privy Council disbanded Chisholm's commission, and the remaining prisoners were released. Now, once again, the spotlight fell upon the pricker Patterson, formerly known as Dixon. He had declared innocent people as witches, and therefore was arrested. Upon arrest, they identified him as also being John Dixon, who had fled arrest at Tain, so he was transported to Edinburgh for trial. While being held in the tollbooth at Edinburgh, it was discovered that John Dixon was not a man, but was in fact a woman. She confessed her name was in fact Christian Cadell, and when she had been in the crowd watching pricker John Kincaid plying his trade, she saw an opportunity to make good money. So she cut her hair short, dressed as a man, changed her name to John Dixon and left Fife to make her fortune as a pricker in the Highlands of Scotland. Why she chose Murray and the Highlands is unknown, but a small fortune she did make, enough to have two servants of her own, as well as comfortable lodgings provided to her by those that hired her. It is suspected that Christian was responsible for 10 and possibly more executions during her time as a pricker. So it was that she was sentenced to life as an unpaid servant on the fever infested plantations of Barbados. A Quaker Englishman from Leith by the name of Morris Trent bought her bond and alongside 13 other convicts, he shipped her to the colonies aboard the Mary of Leith ship. This is when Christian's story ends in the history books and no more is heard of her. A lot of convicts were known to have perished on these ships during the journey, but even if she made it to the colonies, life there must have been hard and very short for people like her. It's possible she perished on the journey or within the colonies. However, what is clear is this woman was an opportunist and a survivor. We think it wouldn't be far-fetched to think that she managed to reincarnate herself once again to begin a new and exciting story. On the 4th of May 1663, as Christian Cadell stepped onto the ship to begin her journey to a hard life, her last victims, Isabel Elder and Isabel Simpson, were being executed in forests. Today, at the foot of Clooney Hill, lies the witch's stone, considered to be the exact spot where these two women met their fate. Thanks for coming in this uncovering journey with us. If you enjoyed this true story of the Scottish Highlands, why not hit the thumbs up and subscribe and follow for more from us at the Highlands Uncovered. Until the next time, have fun folks.